Welcome, first of all, uh, to, to talk about the highly available Cloud Foundry deployment that Allstate have put together. I'm um, excited to be sharing some, some of the things that, that we did and how we also built out this architecture from the ground up. It was a real challenge sort of for, for Allstate because it was really part of a transformation project as well. And moving away from the traditional legacy style uh, systems that they had, uh, moving primarily uh, onto Cloud Foundry for lots of the new services that we were, we were looking to, to build out. So first of all, just a bit about, about myself. Uh, I'm one of the senior platform engineers uh, within Allstate. And what we actually do is our team is basically the engineers that operate and build out uh, the Cloud Foundry platform. Uh, and we're still constantly working on that on a daily, daily basis, looking to integrate new services uh, into the environment to really enhance what we have there from a user experience perspective. Uh, I'm also on, on Twitter as well. Um, so if you have any questions or ever want to follow up on anything, you know, do feel free to, to reach out to me. So the goals. So the goals of today is what I really want to do is I want you to leave with shared understanding of you know, the foundational infrastructure that underlines the Allstate platform. So really what we put together to build and design this highly available platform and the operational principles that underline the platform. So some of the key aspects that we actually looked at from the start to say, okay, if we are gonna build a truly high, highly available platform, these are some of the things that we need to factor in to, to the design. And also how we also actually have highly available deployments. So towards the end, I'll discuss that and provide more information that you can actually look at um, how we've actually achieved that as well. So first of all, I'm going to look at some of the concepts that I think are key to what Allstate have actually, you know, what we actually looked at whenever we were designing and building this. So the first one is, is, is the availability zone. So the availability zone, it's, it's an isolated uh, location within our, within our data center. So within each of our data centers, we have you know, two availability zones. We then also have our regions. So our regions are our data centers that are geographically dispersed between, between the, uh, the Midwest and the east, east, Eastern US. And also the security zones. So we've also split out what we actually have in place so that if it has to be secure, we have a security zone for that. If it's something that we're coming in from the internet or public, then we have our, our DMZ for that. And these, these are really the key building blocks that we have uh, within the platform. Now just moving on, just looking at sort of some of the limitations initially whenever we were actually, and some of the challenges that we had whenever we were looking to build this out. You know, we couldn't deploy Cloud Found, a single uh, Cloud Foundry deployment across the multiple networks. So within each of our availability zones, we've had to push out multiple foundations. On VMware, you know, the vSphere that we use, it required a single management plane. And we also required shared storage across the virtual machines. So they were sort of some of the challenges that we saw at the start, but we never let that affect where we wanted to get to as the end goal. So let's look now just at the actual architecture of the availability zone. As I said before, we have two availability zones within each of our regions. And we have a two region build up. Within those availability zones, Everything itself is self-contained. So each of the availability zones has its own network switches, has its own firewalls, has its own load balancers, and its own shared storage. Now within our regions, whenever we're actually within the, the local environment, between the availability zones, we have about a two, a latency of about two milliseconds. Across the regions, it's greater than that. But the way in which we obviously built the highly available platform and why we use Cloud Foundry as well was we looked at it from a region perspective of we didn't just want to be constrained to actually on premise. We want to then be able to look to the future where we could potentially push up into the cloud into using things like AWS, Azure, or the Google platform. We're also continuing still to integrate with all our legacy services. So within here, Although we have our availability zones, we still need to leverage things like Active Directory and some of the shared services that we have within the environment. 
So how do we actually go about building this? So you know, how do you build an availability zone? One thing, whenever this was being built, as I say, as part of the operational principles, is you know we always heard a lot in business about you know we want this that this five nines concept. So whenever it came to actually looking at that and seeing what we were doing in the legacy world, whenever we were actually trying to achieve that, we weren't really giving the highly available platform and solution, and that's where Cloud Foundry has allowed us to actually do that. It's allowed us to drive down from whenever there were services issues that could maybe result in high availability issues or disaster recovery, going from maybe 30 minutes to an hour for even some of our critical systems, down to an enterprise that was completely active active. So to start out with, everything has to start somewhere. So what we started with, we started with the first physical server. And from that, we added more servers and created a cluster, which then gave us a lot of capacity and a lot of compute. And what that actually looks like then within our racks and cabinets is we have 37 servers, 756 CPUs, uh, 14, over 14,000 gigabytes of memory. You know, pretty powerful for what we're trying to do and achieve. Bearing in mind we were just in the initial stages of building a platform out and starting to bring in our digital transformation and bring our services and applications on board. From that, we then needed to add our storage. From the storage, we then connected the switches to them. And then we actually virtualized the platform. So all and everything that we run on our Cloud Foundry deployment runs on VMware. So, we then add in a pair of load balancers. So as I said before, within it we have our two security zones. We have our internal and our DMZ. So we have pairs of load balancers for each of those availability zones. And this was to ensure that you know, static routes weren't, weren't, weren't being added, so that everything we knew was coming directly in through the load balancers, and making sure that they were actually separating out things physically so we were meeting the requirements of the business from what they were saying from a security standpoint. And to, the, and to secure the environment, we then added firewalls. And again, with a pair of firewalls for our internal and for our DMZ. And that's really very much looking at it dependent upon the type of, type of traffic that's coming in, if it's internal or if it's external. And we'll see that later on further in the slides of what actually the, the environment then actually came out to look, uh, to look like. Then from this, we obviously build our DMZ and public security zone, and we have our internal network and restricted and confidential security. So how that then looks is, it's basically one rack initially, which was then connected up to the internet, to our extranet core and to our internal core. So where we have our two feeds for our internal clients on the Allstate network and where users will come in from the internet. We then also built that out four times and then had that all connected directly in. From that, we then put Cloud Foundry on to the availability zones. So as I said before, whenever we have our availability zones in place there, we have our Cloud Foundry DMZ and our Cloud Foundry MPN, and each one of those is a separate foundation. So there's no traffic and there's no communication that we have between those, those zones. To actually do that, what we use is we use, we use Concourse, and we're also, we've also developed a, an Ops Manager CLI tool which actually helps us deploy that. And we've just actually open sourced that and released that um, in the last couple of weeks. So how does this compare with our data center as it is now? Well, previously in our data centers, everything would have been very, would have been very fragmented. This process has allowed us to consolidate the environment, to actually bring in a rack and roll straight into the data centers. It removes the potential for failures. So we actually isolate the failures. So if there's a failure within one availability zone, the traffic is up and running across everything else. There's no impact to your applications and to those users. So they, they, don't, they don't see 
and easy going offline is any issue. And it also allows us to be a lot more portable. So as I said before, if we wanted to move this stuff into the cloud, we can then do that. You know, looking back at how Allstate would have done things before, whenever we look at the isolated failure domains, that wouldn't have been the case. It would have been the case that if there was something wrong in the part of the network, that would have taken out the majority of, of the systems and resulted in you know, disaster recovery. We've also made sure that whenever it comes to things like power, everything is separated out. So we have two feeds with two separate power lines coming in as well. So looking back at you know, day one and what we actually looked at and what we wanted to try and achieve. Well, the first thing was we wanted to target availability at 99.9%. So that's really saying what we're giving is we're giving a downtime of eight hours and 45 minutes per year. And that was a real change from the traditional model that actually existed. Traditional model, we used to hear, yes, you know, we want three nines, four nines, five nines. But the data center and the way in which the infrastructure was built didn't allow us to actually handle that and give that level of service to what our users and consumers expected. Disaster recovery is automatic. It's derived from the availability of the platform. So if one, of, if, if one of our regions goes down, we still have an active active traffic. We still have everything going across to our second data center. So in the event of a disaster in one, there's no need to panic. Things are still going to be running functionally. With capacity planning, again, we're looking at a true cloud provider and platform system and experience. So one that we're able to actually look at the number of applications that are on the system, and we're able to aggregate that against the, 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 the amount of capacity that we have. And if we need to build this out further, then we can go back, we can look at our model, and we just rack and roll the next, the next uh, level of equipment into the environment. And also maintenance releases. So previously, Maintenance releases would have been something that we would have had numerous teams on and you would have had your application teams, you would have had um, our operations center, you would have had maybe your server admins. So whenever a piece of work was actually being carried out, everything was being taken down. Within the environment that we have, whenever we're carrying out any piece of maintenance to guarantee the level of avail availability, we actually roll that through the availability zones themselves. So we carry out a piece of work on one availability zone, then we move on to the next. So again, not impacting the experience that the users have and giving a real true uptime to them. So this is an overall architecture of what our environment looks like. And as you can see, it's, it is segmented. So we have our, we have our internet user, and they'll come into a load balancer, and we have our MPN user. And from those, depending upon the type of traffic that they're, they're looking at, so for example, although we have our MPN user, and they could actually come in through, through the top as well as the bottom, that's all dependent upon the type of security that's there. If there needs to be a form of authentication for the application, then they can come in through the top level GSLB, and we have ISAM in place, and applications that actually sit on our DMZ components that acts as like reverse proc uh, proxy applications. So that will then route the application through down to the actual service that sits within our internal network itself. So some of the other keys to really take from it is, as well as us building this, we also came up with some ideas around to see, you know, our Cloud Foundry application architecture. So what we said to our application teams was, okay, whenever you're doing a deployment, if it's just something for internal, what we'd like you to do is deploy a minimum of two instances across each of the availability zones. Now you may wonder why we actually did that. Well, one of the, one of the things that we found at the start was, it was through some testing of some of our application teams, if they were doing some work and the availability zone was up, but they had maybe taken down, they just wanted to see something, they had taken down their, their application on 
one of the availability zones, they get sporadic issues. They start seeing like 404 errors. But if we had the extra one there, so for example, if it crashed and hadn't restarted, if they have the extra one there, whenever it comes to our load balancers and then sending that through to CF itself, that doesn't pose any problems. But one of the challenges that we still do have within, within it, and it does, you know, it will tend to affect the data services, is we've had to still push our database application, you know, our, our databases for persistence still have to be outside of the Cloud Foundry environment, which is a challenge, but it's something we're actually working at at the minute. So we're, we have a development team in Tempe that are actually looking at how we can integrate that in with Redis and RabbitMQ and using some open source technology to actually give good data persistence across our environment. Once that comes in, that again will be a real, real win for what we're trying to do. So there are some differences then whenever we have our internet facing or authenticated applications. So previously we said, okay, whenever you're doing a deployment, you have to deploy it eight times. Well, now you have to deploy it 16 times. Again, the reason behind that is, is because of the proxy apps that we have sitting within our DMZ. So if no actual service is running in our DMZ environment, it's just really acting there as a routing through to our main service, which is sitting on our internal network. And for that, we're using, we, we are, we are using ISAM. And what was said to our teams is, well, okay, if you require any authentication, you, you have to use this model and method. If you're just doing pass-through, and you're just letting anybody within the internal organization actually access the, the system, then it's good. You, know, you don't need, you, you don't need to, to worry about this. So moving on to some of the challenges we had around you know, highly available application deployments. So obviously within our infrastructure, whenever application teams come to actually pushing out the code, they're having to push that across multiple foundations. What we wanted was we wanted you know, a zero downtime across those multiple locations using a blue-green deployment. You know, we wanted the apps to be consistently deployed across those environments. And we also wanted change management automation. You know, we didn't want a system where it was going to take an inordinate amount of time to fill out paperwork to say that you're doing a change. We just wanted something that if a developer needs to push out their code, they can do that quickly, and all the relevant change management process is worked through. So how did we achieve that? So to achieve that, we had a team in Tempe, Arizona, and they developed a product called Conveyor. And the prime build of that was to deploy the applications, to actually push them across the multiple environments using the blue-green deployment, you know, to fully automate the creation and of auto open, auto close of the change records. But more importantly and key to it, from a, from a highly available application perspective, was to also handle auto rollback fun functionality. If something doesn't work in one of our foundations, it makes sure that everything is rolled back to how it was prior to that release. And the great thing about it is, it was the first piece of open source software that Allstate actually released. So if you have a look there, it's called Deployodactyl, and I recommend that you, you go have a look at that. It may be of use to you. you know, feel free to fork it and uh, make pull requests. You know, we want to obviously you know, give back to the open source community as well. So what does this look like? Well, all our users use Jenkins for their, for their, for their pushes. And initially, it was just a single curl to this conveyor API. That API went, opened up the change record, went and got the artifacts from Artifactory, then carried out the deployment and actually pushed that out across each of the zones in turn. And it would only ever push it out to one zone at a time until that had finished. And if there's any, you know, for example, at the first step, in our first region and availability zone, if there was a failure there, 
it wouldn't try and carry on. It would just straight roll back. Even if it got to the last one in field, in region two, again, straight roll back. So we're guaranteeing that using the blue-green deployments that we're, you, we have a, a truly highly available platform. So what are some of the early successes that, that we actually had within this setup to make sure that we weren't impacting the applications? So we needed to do uh, a retrofit of our power distribution units on the rack and roll cabinets. And it was for future maintainability. So what we actually did in data center one was we did that live. We relied upon the intra-AZ resiliency. We did the swap out of the, of the PDUs. And within that, we had zero downtime and zero impact to any of our applications in the environment. So nobody at that stage knew that we were actually carrying out any work. When it came to data center two, it required a full power down. But again, whenever we did that, we did that over two nights at six, hour, at six hours apiece, starting in the US and finishing off in, in, in Belfast. Again, we had no impact to the environment, to our users. So the true cloud experience, the true experience for users, that their applications that they needed to access were there without any impact to them or to the business. And the result of that is, you know, we can see now that, you know, we can complete, or complete the maintenance with, with zero impact to applications. And we're also doing that as we obviously use concourse for our deployments, and as we roll through the environments and actually start to upgrade the versions of Cloud Foundry that we have, we know that that isn't going to impact the users themselves. The services are going to be available. There'll be zero downtime. And it means that we can then truly live in to the idea of 99.9% .9 availability, which, as I said before, in the legacy world of our business, we weren't able to achieve. We like to say that we could do that, but it wasn't something that we were actually doing. So I'm coming up just to, to, just to the end of the slides here. So with some further information about some of the things that, that, that Allstate are doing. So if anyone is interested, you know, feel free to have a look at those. You know, there's a good talk um, by, by our director of cloud engineering, Matt Curry, uh, and Alan Moran around um, how we use Concourse at the Spring One Summit. We've also got uh, Deployodactyl, which, as I say, is our first open source piece of software. We also do have uh, a Ruby gem called Ops Manager Clay, which, again, is open source. So feel free to have a look at that as well. And that's what we're using, again, for, for deployments. And probably one of the things that, that you know, we, we've seen as part of being part of Allstate and the transformation that's going on, and, and a good talk, I think, is, is Matt Curry's uh, talk about branding a culture around technology and the cultural transformation that we have actually gone through. So that, that rounds everything up that I have. Does anybody have any questions at all? Yes? Yeah, sorry. Uh, how many platform deployments uh, can you have at large in uh, one availability zone? So what we have is we only have one deployment with, within the availability zone, so each one is its own foundation. Any other questions? Uh, just some sure. Um, if you try to scale your pod, uh, what is the maximum latency that you know? I mean, how many how many pods can you scale to uh, stay under two milliseconds latency? So we'll be able to scale anything within our local data center. So anything with anything within that region will be able will be able to scale that up. And it's something that we've worked very closely with our network guys to make sure that we are getting that low level of latency within our region. Then when we're going out, seeing exactly what that is as well. Yes? You want to make the chain creation and closure. Yes. What about the approvals? That's all auto approved. Really? Yeah. So, so what actually happens in that process is the changes, the changes is opened. It actually has the product manager as the approver. 
So it's all tracked and traced. So what, what some of the application teams actually do is they'll actually have within their Jenkins job uh, a piece that will actually add that approver in. So the product manager approves it. So it's all auditable, traceable throughout. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Architecture. Yes. Your different, the different cloud boundaries in different AZs don't talk to each other at all. Correct. And you mentioned that you, you, you might be moving the um, stateful uh, databases, as, such as Ravi and Kubernetes, yes. to yep. inside to, to the cloud boundaries. Mm -hmm. But then you will be forced to make them. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to be forced to open up certain things to allow us to actually do that. So we have a team, we have a team out in the US at the minute that, that are actually looking at that and working on that. So they've actually got that working locally um, using, using Bosch, which is pretty much probably what it's actually going to end up on. It'll just be a Bosch deployment that will sit within our availability zones, but not within the Cloud Foundry infrastructure itself. What data stores do you use today? So the data stores that are traditionally used today are Oracle and SQL Server. Okay. Yeah, so there's async rep. Um, so for SQL Server, they use database mirroring. Um, but it all depends upon the application as well. So, so what they actually have is depend upon the tiering. They, they may use, they use this nasty term that I don't like is called uh, remote recoverable, which is basically, well, if it fails, you're going to have to back up and, and restore. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so the problem that, that, that we're also having and that we want to tackle is we want to make sure that whenever somebody comes in to an availability zone is making a request, they'll actually stay with inside that. Whereas at the minute, whenever somebody comes in, they could be going elsewhere, which, it, which is a big challenge from, from, from a data store perspective. You know, we have some large systems that whenever they're actually coming in, they could be going into region, region two. The primary database is in region one. You know, and it, it, pro it provides a, bit, a big challenge because it increases the latency there, therefore. That makes sense because basically all that's more than the Yeah, it is, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good problem to have and a good problem to really, you know, try and tackle and solve as well. Uh, any other questions? Listen, I'd like to thank you all for your time. I appreciate you coming along. If you do have any other further questions, you know, do feel free just to, to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to answer them for you. Thank you.